John Pierce and his wife Norrie returned from the United States in 1973 and discovered a rundown 200 hectare coastal block on the western shores of the Kaipara Harbour. 30 years of biodynamic farming and development has transformed the property, now known as Shelley Beach Farms. In the process, it's become something of a beacon for those interested in chemical free farming practices, attracting students from all over the world. We're presently farming about 500 acres and that's what we started off with 33 years ago. But when we arrived here, there was no fences, no trees, no water, no grass, just thistles. It had been a rehab farm that was allowed to run down over 16 years. We started off with a pH of 4.6 and we were advised both by government and a private consultant not to even try planting grass seed for three years until we got the pH up by putting a tonne and a half on every year. But uh, we didn't do that, we only put half a tonne on and we put half a tonne of lime uh, each 10 years and that's the only input that we put other than what we make ourselves, the biological activated uh, biodynamic preparations and the fish fertiliser. These fish are predominantly just a waste product to the local fishermen and being right on the ocean as we are we can get as much as we can cope with and we've very fortunately stumbled upon an enzyme that actually dissolves protein very, very quickly. And so it only takes a matter of weeks in the summer and a few months in the winter to totally turn these solid bodies into a liquid that we then dilute down about one part in 50. And that's the basic fertilizer this farm has had for the last 30 years. Well, it's a nitrogen and phosphate uh, foliar feed, uh, to put it into conventional terms. But it's absolutely loaded with enzymes and uh, interesting proteins that we're only just starting to understand how they work. You know, the, one of the fascinating things is that we can now grow grass under pine trees. Uh, the acidity is actually cancelled out by just one little protein. Some of the vineyards are now getting it from us because that seems to be where the big growth factor is in organics. The number of sheep we've run over the years has varied considerably. We have encouraged quite a number of brown sheep over the years because we had a good market for hand spinning uh, wool in Germany, in the Greece. That's fallen away quite badly, so yeah, we're, we're re-evaluating sheep at the, right at this moment. We just go for one big lamb early in the season. We find that we can breed the lambs that are born really early th the next season without too much stress. We get nearly three metres of rain here um, a year, which is, means that what we grow and the condition of the sheep and the need for shelter is quite different to what the, uh, those requirements are in the south. So yeah, we have a Northland sheep. We certainly don't uh, claim to have a universal sheep. The Perindale is more like a goat, and so we use a lot of tree lucerne and tagasasti and uh, also barna grass, uh, tropical sugar cane. And I think that's what we need in the north, are these more subtropical type plants to offset uh, what's happening in the clovers, for instance, with the beetle and uh, the, the flea. It's not being able to pass the sheep on to other breeders that is our greatest hardship, because we think we've found something rather special. Multiple species of animals really helps with the pasture. Using geese and emus, horses, pigs, and rotating them all. In fact, set stocking them for a month or two in the summer cleans it up nicely. We're 60% kaikuya, which of course has always been considered the curse of the north, but we wouldn't come through the last couple of summers if we didn't have it. But if you don't manage it properly, it really ends up being a nothing value grass. The goats can actually manage it maybe better than anything else that I know of, but um, we'll clean up areas with horses. Horses will actually eat it right back and it's actually good and it'll come away. The outlet that we had for our organic milk from 200 cows was compromised when Fonterra took over the Puhoi cheese factory and discontinued our contracts with just six weeks to find another outlet, so we had to sell the herd. Presently we're running a very small Jersey dairy herd to supply us with our own milk products and that's supplemented by 75 um, to 100 Angus breeding cows. We're just very fortunate, we've got a lot of fingers in many different pies uh, on this property and so we can 
just very quickly change our emphasis if we need to economically just to sustain ourselves or um, economically to take us into the future. We've always wanted to find an added plus for the beef cattle and it looks like we're onto it now with the beef jerky for Japan. We're just working out the, the spices and things at the moment too, so we can start growing those in bulk. This is Bana grass, B-H-A-N-A. -A. In Africa it's known as elephant grass because the elephants gravitate to it in dry times, but our cows absolutely love it. It's very similar to sugarcane, but it's been crossed with the pearl barley, which actually makes the seed infertile, so it doesn't sp spread. So where you put it, it lives. But it's what we planted most of our orchards with. We actually put the rows of the barna grass in two years ahead, and that was the shelter for the trees, the macadamias, the persimmons, the figs, whatever. And um, you can grow within a metre of one of these plants, and it will not compete. It's a demonstration of maybe what we have to do in drier times and warmer times because it's a little bit frost tender but it just supplies so much more biomass than, than grass ever could. It's grazed at least three or four times every summer. It's what they use in South America to produce their ethanol is this barna grass. It doesn't like anything too fertile or too, too wet, but um, no, it needs no fertilising, no care whatsoever. The cattle just maintain it and make it into a hedge virtually. It was the agricultural students that became interested internationally through the Steiner and the wolfing systems. They came with their ideas and their experiences and we farmed them. We had some wonderful master's thesis come out of the projects. Dung beetles is just one of them. Fish farm is another, the barna grass is another. Yeah, it just goes on and on. We are registered under the International Indigenous Peoples Organic Standard, which gives us access to virtually every third world country in the world. And it's our technology, it's our IP that we want to trade, not food. I think the crowning achievement is having supported over 200 students through the 30 years who have now gone off around the world and have started up their own farms, many of them actually coming together. Within the year that they were here, three or four of them will come together and get a bit of land in East Germany or Poland or somewhere and start to replicate what we've done. I think that's what I want, it's dissemination. We have many, many choices of what we produce and that's why we're really 10 farms in one but it's what we put into human involvement here that I think is the significant reward and return that the farm has. We were very fortunate that we didn't have debt and that we created a trust uh, that people were able to come and go with no cost. Um, we provide for everything right down to your boots um, and that the farm has sustained this. It's, it's an educational um, community, really. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.